This will feature a use case presentation from Mike McLeod of AccuRed Corporation. So let's learn a little bit about Mike. Mike's background is this. He's worked with AccuRed Corporation for 23 years as a master engineer. He's kind of a wizard of fun element analysis and test methodology development. He's responsible there for application and development of engineering analysis tools applied to commercial wheel, excuse me, commercial truck wheel design and validation. Mike's educational background is a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Auburn University and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Alabama at, at Huntsville. As Alex mentioned, this presentation will be featured at one of our upcoming user group meetings. More information about those user group meetings will be shared at the end of this webinar. For today's presentation, this is going to feature ENCODE Glyphworks and Design Life software and show how they were applied in a real world environment to provide actionable insights into the development of commercial truck wheels. Mike will be describing how Accurate Corporation successfully uses ENCODE for analyzing field loading and stream history data for durability testing. We'll also discuss methods for developing representative accelerated biaxial load spectrum with equivalent fatigue damage, as well as validation of these loading spectra using the same strain gauged wheel in the indoor test machine. I encourage you all to ask questions through the WebEx Q&A panel. All questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation in a specific Q&A session. Before we dive in, here's a little bit of information about Princia and who we are. Princia offers a full range of engineering software, training, and services to help you develop durable and reliable products. And did you know, speaking of training, that all of our training classes are now offered online, hosted by live instructors? You may know Princia from two software product lines, ReliaSoft for reliability analysis and ENCODE for durability, fatigue, and vibration analysis. The left column contains tools for reliability analysis, such as life data and failure data analysis, reliability test planning, and system reliability modeling. The middle column contains tools for reliability management to manage risk, optimize maintenance, and um, shepherd correct act, corrective actions. On the right-hand side, we have ENCODE tools for durability, analysis of measured time series data, vibration, acoustics analysis, the newest one being Akira, which offers a web portal for access to measured data and various tools with secure access. Today's webinar will focus on how Accuride met a challenge related to durability using ENCODE Glyphworks and Design Life software. So now I'll hand it over to Mike so we can learn more about his exact challenge and solution, how they accelerated their structural validation testing of a commercial truck wheel using ENCODE software. So Mike, over to you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, let's make sure that we try and Ah, there we go. Oops. Right, we'll start here. Ah. All right, we'll get the slides synced up here. Come on, next slide. All right, get this keyboard. There's a slight lag in the. Uh, there we go. So, um, I am excited to be able to share. Some of the work, this is an, an ongoing effort uh, at Accuride. Uh, so some of the things we're showing you are basically the status or things we've already done. Uh, we will have a lot, should have a lot more actual results and validation um, information on how all this is turning out at the uh, user group meeting later this fall. Uh, so you'll want to kind of follow and and check up on that. So this that'll be an expansion of what you're going to see today. But let me start out real quick, uh, introducing you to Accuride, uh, because it does set the context and the background for the uh, application what we're going to be talking about here. Um, Accuride is a leading supplier of um, commercial truck wheels to the North American market as well as the European truck and trailer market. Uh, we provide both forged. Uh, aluminum wheels, as well as uh, steel wheels, and then we also have a 
a uh, host of what we refer to as wheel-in components, uh, things like brake drums, hubs, slack adjusters, those things that go on the end of the axle. Uh, but the wheel, bit, wheel is the, the primary uh, product that we work on here. Uh, we are divided into three business units, so one that focuses on North America, and then another business unit that focuses on Europe and Asia, and then the third business unit focuses on the, the wheel-in solutions. Uh, have about 5,000 associates worldwide um, with uh, about 14 manufacturing facilities and half dozen distribution centers that support all those and another dozen or so. Um, we produce contract manufacturing, people that manufacture things for us, components. Um, once we expanded worldwide, we're uh, now a billion dollar plus company. Uh, but my personal focus is the North, uh, North American Wheel Engineering Group, and that's what we'll focus on today. Um, so what I want to talk about real quick, kind of leading as an introduction, is some of the development trends that we've seen over, or I've seen over my experience with Accuride, <coughs> and the, uh, uh, a little bit about what the current uh, North American truck validation standards are. So how, when you see a tractor trailer with the wheels on it, how are those wheels actually validated um, to uh, be acceptable to, to be in use here? Uh, and then some of the development methodology that we're looking at of how to expand and improve our testing. Uh, we've just completed a bunch of data collection in support of this project, so I'm going to show you uh, really that data collection and how we're using Glyphworks uh, and even design life a little bit to to do the post-processing and how that uh, is used to support this project. And uh, then eventually how we develop the equivalent uh, accelerated test load program. So th these are trends that most companies in one way or another see, but uh, over the last 20 some years or, or longer, you know, our cost continually increase uh, labor and that material costs. So to offset that, um, one of the ways of offsetting that is to reduce the expense of making a wheel by taking weight out, removing uh, the raw material, optimizing more. Uh, the weight reduction is also driven by the overall desire to, and for supporting uh, light weighting of vehicles that support fuel, you know, uh, fuel economy and emissions reductions, those types of things. Um, our actual load rating or design requirements for wheels has actually been pretty flat um, for many, many years, and that's largely driven by regulatory requirements. Uh, so the amount of load that a truck can put on a wheel is, uh, is basically split up. If they need more load, they put more axles and more wheels to support the load, but the load per wheel has stayed relatively constant. Uh, the design technology has been on a really a pretty steep incline. Um, from what we could do 20 years ago as far as simulation work and analytical tools and test and measurement capability uh, has continues to advance quite rapidly. Um, the validation standards, our test for wheels, really is I don't want to say it's flat, it's, it, is, it is increasing, but our, the testing methods um, have been very constant for many years. Uh, we've enhanced those a little bit, and the failure criteria and things, little adjustments um, here and there, but they haven't really dramatically changed. Um, then there's a whole area of uh, robustness and sensitivity, and we're not going to really dive deep into that that part of it because that's that could be a whole presentation on its own. It's quite complex um, in that. But that's the validation standards is really what we're focusing on today. I mean, and it does have a link with robustness and sensitivity. Um, so this is basically the primary, there's a couple other small smaller tests, but the two primary tests for commercial truck wheels. Now they're a little different than the automotive wheels. Um, as far as the testing, but commercial truck follows the SAE uh, J267, and one of those is basically a drum test, which is a basically a straight rolling 
of the wheel over a large diameter drum. Uh, the wheel is overloaded and slightly overpressurized to accelerate the the uh, fatigue lights that's rolled out of that. Uh, and then we, there is a what's referred to as a cornering test, or some people refer to it as a rotational bending test. This is actually done without the tire. The wheel is mounted to a rotating table, and a hub and short shaft is applied or attached to side load, which generates the moment, and the table spins. Um, those are the basic two tests industry-wide for commercial truck wheels. Um, the strength of these tests, and they were developed many years ago, is they're relatively simple tests to, to perform. Um, and there's also, because we've been doing this testing for many, many years, there are years and years of historical data that support that these tests actually um, are working good as a validation tool. Uh, and that's because of our really very low warranty and field issues that we see. Now, part of that is because Accurite's uh, endurance requirements go up and beyond SAE. Um, so we have our own comfortable limit as far as how many cycles that we want to see. Uh, and this works really well for robust designs, designs that have a lot of some extra thickness, but. Uh, the wheel designs are getting thinner and thinner and lighter, or wheels are getting lighter, and some of that robustness is, is uh, gradually decreasing. So some of the weaknesses uh, of this test method is it doesn't always capture all of the important loading or experiences that a wheel might actually see out on the field or on axle truck, uh, and particularly the, some of the lateral loading in combination with the radial loading. Uh, since these two tests are independent. So what we have on, we have two independent tests here that have a basically a single load application. So it's a basically a constant amplitude test and we run it for a period of cycles and are looking for um, fatigue, evidence of uh, fatigue damage that builds up. Um, the potential weaknesses is, is as we get lighter and lighter, those other forces and other loading become more important uh, so there's a potential, eventually, you'll get where you have, may have missed some failure modes. Um, and there's currently no standard for uh, field damage. So as the environmental effects hit the wheel, um, that uh, the other last thing I'll point out here before move on is that these tests uh, validate or qualify a wheel for any position on the truck. And so the different positions have significantly different uh, reactions with the, in the real world. Um, so just a note on robustness, because this um, a lot of different ways of defining this. Uh, my per personal way of looking at robustness is the ability of a design to withstand the unknown usage and variation. So this is the things we don't know uh, or the wheel might experience that go beyond the specific design and validation so when we design something, we know what loads, we design for specific loading and testing, we qualify to that, but there's all kinds of extra things in the wheel. Uh, the bottom line here, though, is that when you have too much robustness, so you have a wheel that can last forever, uh, so to speak, uh, you really have, you're paying a penalty for that wheel uh, in excess material um, and such. Likewise, when you have too little robustness, um, there will be field uses and that w other things in the field will affect that and there's a, that can be a very expensive proposition as well. So trying to get it right is, right amount of robustness is important. Um, so what we're doing here, trying to improve our testing so that we can, as we get lighter and lighter, we'll have a test that captures more of what the wheel will actually see uh, in the field. And there's kind of two ways to do that. Um, for the heavy trucker, two approaches. One is going with, on the left-hand side, the picture is a, it's actually an LBF biaxial piss machine. Uh, so the wheel tire is put inside a drum. There's two curbs in the drum, and the wheel can be run against one curb or the other to produce positive and negative lateral loads, as well as just the radial. So we can get a whole profile of combinations of of um, radial load and lateral load um, 
that will represent um, a uh, some field experience. The the other approach to doing this would be a um, essentially you have a drum test and you can what's called a slip angle test. You can apply a a um, an angle to the wheel so it doesn't drive it doesn't the axis isn't lined up perfectly with the drum and that will produce a side force on the wheel uh, in combination with the radial load. So there's two different ways. And again, you put a, you have a variable spectrum. It isn't a constant load. You have a uh, distribution of load cases that you run uh, to develop your fatigue damage. Uh, and that's sort of what we're looking for. Uh, so how do you do this? Uh, borrowing a slide from, from uh, ENCODE, the general approach is to uh, get a sample of your actual structural response that you that you want to represent. This could be a strain gauge on a wheel uh, or whatever. Um, and then we're going to evaluate, is this really a quasi-static or is it really a dynamic event? Uh, we are typically in the uh, one to two hertz range. So this is, we can fall into quasi-static, and the current test methods really fall under constant amplitude. So we have a constant amplitude, and we just run it. Uh, you can do a block cycle uh, approach to expand that. But what we run into then is we take one strain gauge at one location of the wheel and run it through GlyphWorks. We can predict a, um, a um, fatigue damage, we can either assume or use the actual material um, and predict a fatigue damage right off the time series data we're gathering. And what you want to do for an accelerator test then is find an equivalent simplified uh, cyclic history that you can adjust the magnitude and duration to acceptable ranges. Um, so what happens then, that's good for one location, but when we have multiple locations, I have multiple responses, and I want to come up with one test that covers all of those. Well, what happens is one of those tests will be, you can match up perfectly. Let's say with a safety factor of one, and you would pick the worst case one, which might line up. The other spots using that same load, but you might have a higher safety factor. So certain parts of the wheel will be kind of over-designed. One will be designed perfectly. Um, but well, basically, adjust the load factor and duration. Uh, like I mentioned, the you can enhance that a little bit by doing multiple constant loading at, at different uh, different uh, uh, durations and add in a little more compl complexity. Um, but we're going to take this a step farther. And so, what we're doing instead of going through this path and coming up with a constant amplitude or block cycle test. We're actually going down a different path, and we want a whole profile of loading. We want, in this case, 5 to 10, but it could be 100. Um, the, what we want to do is reduce the thousands of different combinations that you see in the field down to a manageable number that gives that's representative. So we're going to go out and gather field usage history. We're grab, going to grab strain gauge data off several representative areas in the wheel. and. That's going to become our structural response. We're going to calculate the fatigue damage uh, from the actual strain gauge data. Now, we have lots of different combinations of this biaxial profile. Since we're not looking at just one cycle, we're looking at lots of different combinations of types of loading. We're going to approximate, we're going to estimate what this should be based on actual distribution of actual loading. So based on our field data, we're going to use what we call a wheel force transducer instead of strains. Measure, we're actually going to measure forces on the hub uh, so that we can do a histogram of the radial and lateral loading and look at the distribution. So uh, most of the truck history is going to be in radial loading, driving straight down the highway, really no, um, you know, most of the loading is just straight up and down a radial through the wheel. Uh, when you start doing turns and stuff, you you get into lateral loading. That'll define a biaxial profile. Then we will use a multiplier uh, on this profile to get the damage uh, to be roughly equivalent to what we're predicting off the strain gauges. So that's the general approach. Um, 
So I want to talk about the data collection uh, a little bit. This is where we just recently completed. We have a uh, a local concrete company here in uh, Henderson, Kentucky, that is uh, we've used. They've been great to help us with some uh, other field testing and just wheel evaluation. So they let us uh, borrow one of their trucks and a driver for the day. And we, on the right hand side, we've got a wheel force transducer. So this is uh, not the actual wheel, but a it's uh, set up to actually measure forces in the all three direction measures moments uh, about the hub, wheels measures wheel speed, wheel position, so the angular position, and actually used some of that data. And then the accelerations on the other side is a strain gauge wheel with a wireless data transfer. And then we have one of our guys in the, in the cab with the data collection, uh, collecting all this data in time series format. Um, in addition to the forces, we're also collecting uh, GPS data and doing some video tracking so that we can go back when we and understand when we see spikes in loading or other why we see certain uh, lateral loading, uh, trying to understand what was the truck going through at the time of those, those loading events. And then we'll collect uh, a few other types of data to go along with that. Uh, so basically, uh, what we did was we found a local route. So this upper left-hand corner of this picture is basically the uh, going through the city of Henderson, Kentucky. So the concrete company is located there. As soon as we pulled out of the shop, we flipped on the data acquisition. So we recorded everything, including driving downtown to pick up the load. We had the lo look. The truck loaded about 80,000 pounds. Uh, most of that was carried on the drive and rear axles. We were instrumented the front axles because the steer, because those are going to generate the highest lateral forces. Uh, we're collecting everything through time series data. And then we repeated the test swapping sides of our data. Um, and then we relied a lot on encode for uh, the data acquisition or the data post processing. Um, on the right is basically a bird's eye view of the data. It's like, okay, all this stuff. Uh, we've collected a high enough frequency that we can actually zoom in and get a lot of the detail, uh, an exceptional amount of detail out of this. Uh, one thing that helped us too is just, we just drove the whole route is we go in and we identify certain key points in this and get the times at these key event points. And those help to subdivide the, the data into the centers. Um, so I have two highway sections about 10 miles coming down to straight highway driving. And then we have a real windy uh, county road. Uh, speeds are much less, but there's a lot of twists and turns going uh, about uh, eight miles or so. And then we get back on some cloverleaf there and another stretch of highway driving. Um, so kind of going back through here. So here's kind of what we did with the data. The first thing we're doing is uh, running it through GlyphWorks through some filtering. Um, like I said, we're in the one to two hertz range, but there's a lot of engine. Uh, we're picking up engine noise, uh, road noise, and vibration. Uh, lots of extra little uh, stuff going on in the data, so we can actually filter out um, a good bit of that. So that what we're getting mostly is the the cyclic behavior from the wheel itself. Um, most of the data is gathered, the force data is gathered in Cartesian coordinates. So we can, within GlyphWorks, uh, recalc take that Cartesian data and we'll recalculate it to a cylindrical data. So we're looking at true radial forces uh, rather than two Cartesian uh, forces. We'll convert that. So some of those calculations, uh, the reference lines I mentioned, those points, uh, we found a very easy way to actually create a, a separate time series file that we imported in, and we can overlay that on the actual data. I got a better slide that actually shows that. Then that that shows us the the points in time at which we hit those points on the GPS data. Um, subdividing all this, the full test into basically highway driving, so we can analyze what highway driving looks like versus what city driving or uh, the different sections. And then the big tool that we used in this. Um, in addition to calculating damage from the time series uh, data directly, 
uh, is you looking at this through histogram. Uh, so looking at the distribution of, of cyclops, both for mean and range on the strain, but uh, also on the force distribution for radial load and the number of cyclists versus radial load and lateral load. Uh, just an example real quick of uh, kind of focusing in on one interesting part of our test. So we'll get, uh, this uh, is actually going through a clover leaf. This, this highway isn't really that busy, so we were, we were very safe to go through and not running into traffic and actually having our truck make some loops through the clover leaf, um, producing some good side loads for us. Uh, so what we're showing here on this left-hand graph is basically the speed of the truck, and then we have the three forces. The X is the going normal to the, uh, or is the forward and aft force. So that's actually very low, except when you have braking at these points. Uh, and then we have the lateral load, and, or yeah, the lateral and uh, vertical loads. So I do the similar thing. I make key points, get the times out of that, and then actually in a little spreadsheet, I create a time series file that I then import into Glyphworks and lay over top of my actual data. And what that does then is I have different labels. Each of these reference lines, I can put a label over it, and they correspond to the different key points. So I can kind of walk my way around and say, okay, what's happening at point B? Okay, I'm up here, and then I can see where the truck comes to a stop here. Point C is it's coming around the loop, actually stops right there, looks both ways and proceeds on. So he's, we can kind of see it and look at the, uh, the average load, lateral loading is probably in the 500 pounds. When he's actually doing tight turns, we go up to a couple thousand pounds of, of lateral load. And then the histogram shows us the distribution, uh, even more information as far as the distribution um, of that. Um, this is uh, just an example of uh, the time series data. This is uh, pulled out a sample of the strain gauge data. So looking on the left-hand side is basically the entire strain history for a couple of our gauges. And there's uh, about 4,000 seconds. So we got a lot of revolutions. Uh, when I, Glyphworks enables me to actually zoom in on this data. And when I really zoom in, I can zoom in over, I think it's uh, about a quarter of a second, enough where I see one, the strain output for one revolution of the wheel. So this is what a, a single revolution of the wheel, you actually get two cycles, uh, a larger cycle and a smaller cycle within one revolution of the wheel. So I've got the ability to kind of zoom in. Um, the state on the right is what we would use for correlating with um, using design life with the FEA and the predictive models. I want to be able to predict this cycle here uh, and how much damage per cycle, and then I can expand that into the real world. So it just shows how we can get the overall data as well as really zooming in and, and getting enough detailed data. Um, this is one I just want to share. I've just got, uh, I think I'm on one or two more slides here. Uh, this is one that the ENCODE support was, um, they're real good when you, you know there's something you want to do and the, the, glyph work, the glyphs that are in there aren't quite set up to do because it's a little out of the ordinary. And um, they were great to, it took them no time at all to just show me how to set this um, thing. I, I can't use the regular histogram display directly, but with the data, uh, I have my two force outputs, and then I actually have the wheel position. I'm actually monitoring. I can know the start and end of every revolution. Uh, so when I do that, I can average the forces over that revolution, and then I can build the histogram data. So what I've actually got displayed then is my uh, Y forces, my lateral force, side force, and my the versus my radial force is just a Z force in this direction. And then I literally count how many cycles it actually went through and look at the distribution. So distribution is, is right in the middle, but we do get some of these outliers and it tapers off. And so that's what my biaxial profile, the distribution of those should look similar to 
um, to this graph. Um, so that's doing that. The, the next step really is is developing the biaxial load pro or the load profile that I want to use. And the plans are to then put that in an actual test with the actual strain gauge wheel and do some validation. Uh, these are this is what I hope to share this fall in here. But uh, so the basic overall challenge that we face, just kind of wrapping up here, is to create a more representative um, accelerated um, basically a biaxial test methodology. So something that will capture that will represent more of the true loading that we would a truck would actually see, you know, the wheels would actually see in, in service. And in that way capture any of the more sensitive potential failure modes by being a little more realistic. Uh, that we're also wanting to compare uh, the real history with the current the old or current methodology from SAE to better understand how uh, the strengths and weaknesses of that test and just how far that test can go or what it can can do. And we can do this with real data. Uh, the other part of the, the challenge or goals here is really to develop and validate the data collection methodology and post-processing. Um, anytime you deal with collecting a lot of data, there's a lot of work um, to changing formats, to coordinate systems, to uh, really getting your post-processing procedure um, tuned just the way you want it. And by doing this in Glyphworks, I'm actually creating kind of templates. So these glyphs that I'm creating create um, post-processing templates. So the next test that we do for different conditions in the field, we will just plug those into these post, same post-processing templates we develop and we'll generate similar post-processing output. Um, so the basic approach to this is gathering some wheel force transducer data as well as the GPS and strain gauge data from what the actual vehicle sees. Uh, you've been utilizing ENCODE, Glyphworks too. Uh, and some of the design, uh, the um, yeah, using all the tools basically uh, on ENCODE to um, do the post processing of the data, um, and then basically trying to come up with a way of uh, yeah an approach for doing the accelerated uh, and validating so that we get a similar um, amount of damage with an accelerated test and then add a a little bit of a safety factor on that to get even more comfortable. Um, so basically the results are we've been able to demonstrate a good uh, approach um, to um, getting this correlation data, the biaxial data that we need, um, use the actual time series strain data from our field tests. Um, kind of the next steps is to show the validation, the correlation with the FDA, with the actual field data, and then to demonstrate a, the uh, validate an actual accelerated test data. Uh, so some of this, a little more detail will be presented this fall. Um, so I encourage you to um, join in this fall with the uh, user group meeting. So with that, Kurt, I'm gonna uh, pass it back to you and a few comments, and then we'll see what kind of questions popped up. Great, great, thanks, Mike. Thanks so much for that. I don't know if I'll ever look at truck wheels the same again. This is some very impressive engineering you have there. Um, I, just to summarize, before we get into question and answer, I think Mike's brought up a couple of really interesting points. They're, they're worth touching on here uh, before we look at specific Q&As. Uh, first point that Mike brought up was that, um, how do we know if an existing test standard is still valid? So we need what Mike referred to before as a snapshot of real world usage uh, to understand how the product is used. And then we need to be able to analyze that measured road load data and gain actionable insights from it, like understanding the degree of uh, multi-axial loading, how prevalent is uh, side loading and radial, radial loading. Uh, is that important to include in a test spec? And as you can see from, from Mike's analysis here, he's, he's shown that uh, to, to, to load a wheel in a validation test with cornering load only or with radial load only may be missing some uh, high stresses and some failure modes uh, as well. Um, so this type of analysis then allows validation tests to be updated to better reflect customer usage. And in the end, that means uh, more confidence in these validation tests and uh, a more durable and lighter weight product. Um, second point that Mike brought up 
was uh, describing the need for correlation. And that is correlating things like how do we correlate lab-based validation testing with service loading? So how do we gain confidence in our ability to test in the lab uh, and have that test replicating the customer's usage? And secondly, this is a really hot topic. How do we correlate with FEA results? So how do we know if the, if, if the finite element analysis, these advanced design simulation tools, as Mike referred to them as, how do we know if they're, if they're, if they're uh, trustworthy? So how do we correlate FEA results with reality so we can gain confidence in this, in these CA-based predictions, this increasing technological availability of, of higher powered analytical tools? So before we get into the Q&A session, let me just ask you one question for you guys in the audience there. Do you have a durability engineering challenge like AccuRides? If so, if you'd like to learn more about how Prensia might be able to help, please contact us after this presentation and let's see how we might be able to uh, work together to improve engineering practices.